Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to the Efficient Practice Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Evelyn Samuel, and I am super excited about our interview today. I have a treat for you all. I have one of the greats in dentistry, one of the people who's contributed most to our wonderful profession. So you're going to want to listen to the end of this interview. Today's guest is Dr. Ron Jackson. Hello, and welcome to the show, Dr. Jackson. Well, hello, uh, Evelyn, and thanks for having me. Oh, we're, we're so excited to have you here. The listeners are in for a treat. There's going to be so many pearls of wisdom on today's show. So definitely, 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 you're going to want to listen until, until the end. But before we dive deep into your interview, Dr. Jackson, I want to say to those who are listening, if you haven't already, please join our free Facebook group. It's called the Efficiency Now Network. Basically, it's a bunch of dentists and professionals, dental auxiliary, people who own businesses who are in there. We're all working together to have more efficient practices like dental and medical practices or use more efficient practices to run our businesses better. So we're all in there helping each other. And also, if you have not already, please, please subscribe to the show. It's the Efficient Practice Podcast. Uh, Now we're available on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, and many of the other podcast mediums. So if you want more productivity, profitability, and a better quality of life, this show is for you. And so now I'm going to tell you all about our very esteemed guest. Now, I can't imagine that you don't know who he is because he is truly a rock star. But if you do not, I will take some time to tell you a little bit about all of Dr. Jackson's, well, maybe not all, but a lot of his accomplishments. Dr. Jackson is a 1972 graduate of West Virginia University School of Dentistry. He completed his general practice residency at the National Naval Medical Center in Bethesda, Maryland. He has published over 80 articles on aesthetic adhesive dentistry, and he's presented over 900 lectures worldwide. In addition, Dr. Jackson has presented at all the major U.S. and Canadian scientific conferences, as well as to organizations and meetings in Europe, Asia, and South America. He is an accredited fellow in the American Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry, a fellow in the Academy of General Dentistry, a diplomat in the American Board of Aesthetic Dentistry. He received the Distinguished Alumni Award from West Virginia University School of Dentistry in April of 2007. He is the past director of the Composite Artistry Program at the Las Vegas Institute for Advanced Dental Studies, and he is also the past director of the Mastering Dynamic Adhesion Program at the Las Vegas Institute for Advanced Dental Studies. Dr. Jackson received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry earlier this year in April 2018, and he practiced comprehensive restorative and cosmetic dentistry in Middleburg, Virginia for 40 years. Welcome to the show, Dr. Jackson. Wow, it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, Evelyn. Oh my goodness, it's my pleasure to have you here. Like I said, I am super excited about this interview. Um, Dr. Jackson, I know you personally, so I, I know that this is a treat. So hopefully I can contain my excitement I'm sure it will come through to the listeners. So um, just stay tuned, guys, because this is really a treat. So before we start talking about all of those wonderful achievements and all the great things that you've done for dentistry, uh, Dr. Jackson, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, what got you into the field? What has brought you to where you are today? Well, that's, uh, that's kind of a long story. Uh, I'll try to be brief, but I'm not known for my brevity. <laughs> Anyone who's ever listened to one of my lectures knows. But anyway, I mean, I got started, um, well, let's go back to when I was nine years old and uh, seeing my hometown dentist. I just admired this fellow. 
he was such a nice person. Um, he, everything he did was uh, so professional, but he was also kind. Um, and when I expressed some interest in what he was doing, he showed me around the office and I thought, oh, these are neat instruments. Of course, I called them tools, but now we call them instruments. But um, at, uh, the detail of everything and in the lab, and, and I, I just uh, thought then at that point uh, that that's, that's what I wanted to do. And so I progressed to that point. In fact, um, it was a goal. It was a planned event to become a dentist. Uh, and it's, uh, uh, as far as a practicing dentist is concerned, um, and, and, and accomplished all of that. Now, all the other things on that resume, I have to admit, um, were not planned events. Uh, I had no uh, intention of, of uh, lecturing and, and uh, traveling around, speaking to uh, dental groups and societies and whatnot, or writing articles and all of those kinds of things. That um, just happened. Uh, it was an accident. In my opinion, it still seems to be uh, like it was an accident. It all basically got started just because I, I was committed to my patients. I wanted to provide better dental care. Um, I was a voracious reader of the literature. I went to courses, a lot of CE. Um, and the more I learned, the more I started to, uh, I guess, what you call innovate. I wanted to do better services for, for my patients. And, um, and so consequently, I got interested in uh, developing new, some new techniques. I thought, well, there's got to be a better way to do this and come out with a better result. Um, and, uh, of course, uh, in dentistry, why we were dealing with materials and we're uh, dealing with technology. Um, and, and so uh, I got involved in um, uh, some of the materials science. Uh, my background, undergraduate, was uh, work was in chemistry, um, which along came composite resins in uh, uh, the late 70s. They weren't uh, worth a whole lot at that point, uh, but they progressed. And um, uh, I began to, in my own dental lab, start to... Um, work with some of these uh, products and see if it couldn't make them better and apply some of my chemical principles. Um, and I should say this too, um, I always, I got involved in dental photography and I encourage every dentist, and I think most dentists do that now, but back in the 80s, why we didn't have intraoral cameras, they hadn't even been invented at that point, so I was taking photographs, extraoral, especially when I was testing something and seeing how it would work. My first product was a, was a temporary. I thought, well, that can't do much harm. Um, it was based in resin, but it had a lot of other things in it as well, so that it would go in easy and come out easy. In fact, uh, the name of the product was called Easy Temp, um, and it was for inlays and onlays. But at, at any rate, I, I always took pictures um, for a couple of reasons. One, to develop photographs to educate my patients, uh, to show them what the problems were. They could uh, definitely... Uh, appreciate them and understand them better when they saw the same thing that I was looking at in their mouth and now they can look in their mouth. Um, and so uh, I took before and afters and then the after pictures would, would help them really see what was accomplished. And so that was kind of a marketing step, a little did I realize how important that marketing step was. Um, but at any rate, it's also allowed me to track those procedures that I did. I mean, you know, you don't know if a material really is better than another material, how it holds up in the mouth, unless you have a way of tracking it. And, and, and so I, I had all these pictures. And at one um, local uh, gathering, study club sort of thing, I, I took my pictures and passed them around. And dentists were saying, well, well, how did you do that? And, and what, what's that? And so I began answering those questions. Next thing you know, uh, it spread to other dental groups. And the next thing I get an invitation to speak to a, a very small society. And then the next thing, why a dental society, a full-fledged dental society asked me to speak. And, and at that point, I realized, well, wait a second, I'm going to have to get this down. I'm going to have to take a public speaking course. I'm going to have to really put together a formal lecture instead of just winging it. And that's how it got going. I, and then the magic word from that dental society, uh, when they asked me, well, what is your honorarium? Well, of course, I didn't even know what an honorarium was at that point. <laughs> uh, so I just said, well, the usual, uh, and so on and so forth. And literally, uh, it just kept going.
Wow. From that standpoint. That's amazing. So it was, it was definitely an evolution. Yes. Uh, it, it evolved because from that standpoint, then, uh, then people's, uh, then editors from different uh, journals started asking me for some articles on some of this stuff. And I just want to begin to write and yes, uh, got invitations, uh, to do work at, uh, at the various universities in the postgraduate, uh, programs, uh, then a live patient, uh, uh, came along at uh, Las Vegas Institute, which I was there for 20 years. Uh, worked with Ross Nash down at his learning center, and um, it it just kept going. I really enjoyed the practice of dentistry. I had uh, I, I really enjoyed teaching it uh, because you can expand your services to if you can show someone how to do something better for their patients, the patient benefits and the practice benefits, and it's it's all good stuff and it's very rewarding. So I. I have been very fortunate, uh, Evelyn. Uh, I, I look back on the career and just, it, it was a terrific thing all the way. Amazing. That is amazing. And you've contributed so much to the profession. And, and that evolution, that is just a remarkable story in itself. Because you mentioned that you had a chemistry background. And so you were able to merge dentistry and the chemistry because so much of what we do in the products, uh, it's all it's all chemistry. It is now, yes, with adhesion. You know, when adhesion came along, um, which uh, just changed the entire scope of restorative dentistry. We could now be very, very conservative. Uh, we could we could build teeth up as they are, rather than um, you know cut them down and, and crown everything. Um, it just it, it just revolutionize the whole and that's of course uh adhesion is uh, is chemistry uh it's it's all chemistry so uh it came along and i jumped right on that because i was so fascinated by it uh and and still the future is is is, is terrific in dentistry it's exploding in all aspects exactly. technology and materials and uh even format now as as we've talked about so, so there again, that's really amazing. I first met you at the Las Vegas Institute. So you were teaching there when I went through LVI. And there is a very distinguished ear about the, uh, the, the doctors that are teaching there, number one, because you all are the, the greatest in the profession. Uh, LVI is known as one of the top aesthetic continuums in learning uh, institutions globally. You've lectured globally. You've taught at LVI. So I first met you there, and, and you've just done all these remarkable things, like I said, in terms of adhesion. I think the advice that you're giving right now is really good for dentists in terms of documenting, tracking, um, and uh, being able to kind of look at your cases and know how to do better. So that stint, you, you were at LVI, and then you helped at the Nash Institute, you said, as well. Yes, Yes. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, and actually, there was an institute in, in London, that uh, uh, postgraduate institute in London, that I uh, was uh, tied into as well on a regular basis, giving courses over there. Amazing. Amazing. So with, with the adhesion, because you're like the, I don't know, the guru of adhesion, adhesion, we all know it, and you know the chemistry, you also helped one of the major companies develop uh, their systems car. You help them develop one of their major um, systems or instruments or materials. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, and and again, that was an evolution. Um, companies would invite me, and and uh, this was uh, something I want to also mention was that it was a, um, a fee for service sort of thing, um, a contract to. Uh, work with them in developing uh, various products, uh, whether it be temporary materials or composite resins or adhesion adhesives um, there. But the, the, the process went on for the last 25 years, actually. So it's, it's, it all built up to um, uh, a product, uh, as you mentioned, from uh, the company is now called Cavocur, and the product is called Sonicfill. And it's the culmination, if you will, of, of all this time and effort and uh, learning that, that happened all before it. And, and I'm most proud of this particular product because this is a product that's good for the patient and good for the practice, good for the dentist. Uh, and it combines the technology 
uh, sonic energy, a handpiece that delivers high frequency vibration uh, with a unique composite resin uh, that has chemistry in it that responds to this uh, uh, high frequency vibration or sonic energy. It's a highly filled paste composite, like a lot of composites are, so it has high strength. Um, but these modifiers, uh, when this high frequency vibration happens, uh, uh, lowers the viscosity. So you have a very high sculptable composite resin, but it goes in as a low viscosity material, similar to a flowable. It's vibrated into the cavity in the same way that we vibrate stone into an impression. Um, so the concept is something we've been doing in dentistry for a long time. We just haven't applied it to, uh, to filling teeth. And so it goes in and, and as a low viscosity adapts extremely well. Uh, long, it's a bulk fill, so along with a lot of good bulk fill materials in the marketplace, why they has, uh, and this is where big advances have taken place. You know, we were always taught you couldn't put in more than two millimeters at a time because they wouldn't cure, the depth of cure wouldn't, wouldn't be uh, deep enough to cure more than two millimeters, and also the issue of shrinkage stress would be too high and there'd be all kinds of negative things that would happen, open margins, etc. Well, all of that's been accomplished through chemistry as well. Um, so you have bulk fills and uh, that four or five, in the case of sonic fill, it'll, it, you can cure five millimeters deep. Uh, and, and, and it has actually, and I'm now uh, just quoting the literature, uh, the lowest uh, shrinkage stress of all uh, materials on the market. Uh, at five millimeters, it has a much lower shrinkage stress than even a material at two. So consequently, uh, you, you can pretty much fill 80% of the teeth in one uh, three or four second uh, procedure. Uh, that is the filling happens in three or four seconds. So what I was getting at is the patient, because of these features, they're in the chair less time. And every patient would like to spend less time in the dental chair, let's face it. Um, and, and without compromise, in fact, I, I believe that uh, it's faster, easier, and better because of the adaptation. But what's good for the practice is, is it, uh, of course, procedure can be um, accomplished in much less time. Um, but also um, it, with less effort and less work and the older I am now, uh, having been around quite a long while, why uh, that's very important. So it saves time and effort and, and that's good for the practice. And, and so I'm very, very proud of that material. It's gone through its evolution. It keeps, continues to improve the original uh, and then so, uh, uh, Sonicville 2 and now of course recently Sonicville 3. And I'm still involved. Um, and again, this was as a, uh, as a paid consultant, all, all of these projects, and I identify that in every lecture or any article, uh, any connection I've had with a product, a financial connection, why I've identified it. So, uh, but I'm, I am very proud of, of, of that, and I'm not done yet. I'm still, still doing some of these uh, uh, consulting uh, gigs, and um, uh, I enjoy that. As you know, I've retired from private practice um, mm -hmm. two years ago, and uh, now, uh, this is uh, also a place where we met. Um, I volunteer in our county's uh, free clinic, something I've always wanted to do, but <laughs> never had the time to do it. Uh, but the first thing uh, after uh, retiring, I wasn't going to be done with dentistry. Uh, it, uh, I love what I do. Um, just can't do it every day, all day, like uh, young people can, like I used to be able to. Um, but I enjoy uh, giving back, uh, and, and this allows me to do that, and, and I'm still enjoying doing the dentistry. So, um, so I do that, and um, the consulting and um, uh, winding down on the lecture circuit now, because um, I prefer to uh, watch the grandkids grow and, and not be on an airplane so much. Right. Right. That's, that's really important what you're saying. You've done a lot of things and, and family balance at some point is good as well uh, with, with the grandkids. And yeah. uh, you said you're tapering down on the lecturing. Are, are you, you're still traveling quite a bit or is it, is, is it a marked difference in terms of how you're lecturing and all these? Uh, different oh, oh yes. It's, it's, uh, I'm not covering as many topics as I used to. Um, uh, it just, uh, yes, I just, uh, more of my travel now is is to traveling to see the grandkids or uh, just take trips with my wife and they're not business trips anymore just just reducing that um, it, it, I enjoyed 
and, and still do. I mean, the teaching part of dentistry, I, I never thought I'd be doing that. And it just, it, it turned into, as I said, it was an accident. And, and as it turned out, I guess um, people must have uh, found some uh, aspect of it worthwhile because they kept coming to the lectures and I kept getting invitations and still do now. But for the most part, uh, there's uh, very few that, that, that I do anymore. Uh, just don't want to give up completely, but that's that's the way it goes. And um, so, there's that's the answer to your question. <laughs> just doing less. Um, it, I'm 71 years old now, and and um, you need to slow down. But my commitment, if I'm practicing in the free clinic, it's a, it's that hasn't changed. Uh, and I might even. Uh, get into a few items that uh, I thought about when you asked me to do this podcast. What 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 would I um, say to the audience that practice in dentistry? Your company is is all about efficiency, and and uh, I, I I would agree with that. Uh, it, it's 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 critical. Uh, uh, but uh, how do you get there? I mean, there's a lot of articles and a lot of speakers on this, and and uh, I think it's uh, uh, certainly something that. Uh, every dentist wants a successful practice, but what, you know, uh, what's a successful practice? That, of course, the definition of success is going to be uh, perhaps a little different for uh, different people. Uh, but whatever you do, however you define success, why uh, you certainly want to achieve it. And, and we're taught in dental school how to, uh, healthcare procedures, how to treat our patients uh, with procedures and uh, identify and diagnose and, uh, and get them to health function aesthetics. But we don't really know a lot about uh, how to run a business, uh, how to be an employer um, there. But uh, there's a lot written on it. And I just want to talk about CE just for a moment because it's, sure. I've been involved in it an awful lot, as we just discussed. But a lot of dentists, I think, look at it to some degree as perhaps an expense when, in fact, they still don't realize that it's, it's an investment just like the investment to become a dentist in the first place. And I would encourage uh, dentists to just, uh, just get on that CE bandwagon and, and, and learn, uh, stay competent. And, you know, when, when you uh, increase your, your competence, uh, uh, you increase your confidence, and that is something that patients recognize. You know, patients know uh, their antennas are up and they're sharp and they're they're aware when they come into the dental office because a lot of times there's a anxiety, perhaps a little fear or or whatever. Um, even if they're longtime patients, they're 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 set up for for this dental visit, and they're acutely aware of everything that's going on. Uh, it's heightened awareness, and so uh, you you have to have your act together in there, and have a have a uh, practice, and have an office, and uh, that's running uh, smoothly, where you have a true team, not just a bunch of employees, but uh, all of whom are working together. I know uh, sometimes if there's five employees, the dentist says, "Well, I've got my team." Um, well, if you you may or you may not have. You may have a staff instead of a team, and there's a huge difference between those two. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to develop, uh, first, you hiring the right people, and that's, there's lots of books on, on that, and, and you're going to make mistakes and learn from the mistakes. That's just the process, but you can also learn from other people's mistakes, too, and that's where the reading and taking courses on practice management is so uh, important. But stay up on on dentistry, find out what it is you like in it. Now, I don't don't try to be all things to all people. I, 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 this is where I differ with some of the practice management people. They think, well, you want to keep everything in the office. You need to do everything. That, that that's a terrible mistake. Um, we all have our likes and our dislikes. I gave up doing endodontics 35 years ago um, <laughs> because I personally um, didn't like endodontics. I, I loved restorative dentistry, and, and I began to just go entirely in that direction. 
And that's the beauty of our profession. You can pick and choose, but find what your passion is and follow it and then take those courses. Uh, that it's not work to read about a subject that you're passionate about. It's not work to go to a course. And next thing you know, you get better and better. And that uh, is better for the patient. They're aware of that. Your team is on board. They see that you're enthusiastic about your dentistry. The patients are, and they get the same way. Enthusiasm is, is, is catching uh, and, and a dental practice. So pick out what it is you like and this, uh, just go for it. Bill Dickerson calls it your, your passion filled purpose. Uh, and, and so, um, uh, that, that's one of the things that I would uh, recommend. Um, I've got a couple of, uh, some books that I would, uh, might recommend to sure. the listeners here. Uh, I'll keep it short. My last lecture at LVI, um, was not a technical lecture. It was on this kind of topic that we're talking about now, same sort of thing. How, is, how do you get from A to B in, in the practice of dentistry? And I said, well, there's a lot of books and I had a whole list of them, but I'm going to just talk about four here. Uh, I would suggest very strongly, and, and the first one is going to sound like a corny title, but this book has been in print since the 1930s. Uh, it's called How to Win Friends, and influence people, and that's by Dale Carnegie. Um, I've probably read the book 20 times during my practice. Every year I would read it, and every time I read it, I got uh, something more and uh, about it. And I would slowly implement um, uh, every month something from that book, shared it with my team. We had team meetings every week, and, and every month we would we would uh, actually talk about that book and, and, and how we're implementing items that were suggested in there. It's a classic uh, there because that's what we're trying to do in our practice. Win friends, our patients and our team, um, the, and influence uh, people. We want to train our team members. How do you do that? That's called influence and same with the, with the patients. Second book um, would be The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. Uh, dynamite. That's not that, I, probably don't, I guess it was written about 10 or 12 years ago. He's written up a second one after that, which uh, is excellent as well. And now I want to talk about two recent books. One is this one right here, written by a good friend, a dentist, of, of a friend of mine from Australia. Um, simplifying life. Well, it, it's, who doesn't want a simpler life? <laughs> But um, there's so much more to it. Uh, it's how to get life right. And uh, let's face it, we've got one shot at this, and we want to get it right. Uh, but it's not something everybody knows. I mean, I didn't. Uh, I learned so much uh, from Brett Taylor, the author of this book. And, and I, it's, it's there is some dentistry things in there and, and, and whatnot, but it's, it's for everybody. I mean, I, I've given this book to so many friends and relatives and anybody uh, that looks like they need it, which is probably about everybody on the planet, I would say. The second book, How to Get the Practice Right, uh, is a book by Bill Dickerson, Successful Happiness. Um, I, I can't say enough about this. And again, Bill's been around a long time. Uh, you know him. A lot of people do. He founded the Las Vegas Institute. Uh, his wife, Heidi, uh, terrific person, and the two of them um, running that. And it just, it's so uh, worthwhile. I can't encourage uh, people. Those, just those four books. Uh, they're easy reads. All of them are easy reads. Um, and share them with your team and talk about them. And I think they'll have a huge impact, along with all the other uh, courses and things that you can do out there. Absolutely. That's a, a words of wise, excellent advice, finding a team, practice advice, reading books. I absolutely love reading books. I read everything. And I think that's one of the pearls I picked up early, early on on the way. And like you said, the books that you're recommending, they're not just for dentists. Uh, of course, we are dentists, so we're going to attract a lot of viewers uh, who are dentists or medical professions. But these tips are universal. And they can be used for anyone in business or just in life. Yes. So, yeah, uh, very good advice. Um, so you've lectured all around the world. You just talked some about some, some pearls uh, of wisdom of making 
a successful practice. And when people are listening, they're listening to you and they're like, oh my goodness, this is Ron Jackson. So uh, he's lectured everywhere. He's done all these articles. He's um, been at all of these uh, uh, scientific uh, continuums and spoken across the globe. Uh, you had a practice and you were just talking about some of the principles of, of uh, you know, getting, winning the patients, influencing the patients and helping your team members and some things like that. But you started in a really small practice in a small town. Is that right? Uh, yes. And so people are listening and they're thinking, oh my goodness, he's Ron Jackson. He, he helped develop the, you know, the uh, sonic, sonic bill. And what would you say? How did you, how did you start your practice in it's, it's Middleburg? How, how did that happen? And how, well, did, how did that happen? The, um, uh, in the introduction, I think you mentioned about uh, general practice residency at the Bethesda Naval Hospital, which Bethesda Naval Hospital right outside Washington, D.C., um, is now called Walter Reed. Uh, it's a weird sort of thing. They closed Walter Reed Hospital, very old hospital, Army Hospital in Washington, D.C. They moved it into the Bethesda Naval Hospital Medical Center facility and changed the name to Walter Reed. But anyway, I was there from 1972 to 73, and um, a wonderful experience. I learned so much there. And uh, we would drive around Virginia. It's always fascinated by Virginia because it's a state that's kind of between the north and between the, between the north and south, the middle of the country on the east coast, rich in history, uh, beautiful state. So we drove around the state, and when we, and where Middleburg is, is 50 miles west of Washington, D.C. It's at the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains, beautiful rolling hills, farmland. And I just fell in love with this one stoplight town called Middleburg and uh, started the practice after, uh, after Bethesda. I needed uh, to, three more years obligated uh, in the Navy and I was stationed in London, England with the Navy, tough duty, but somebody has to do it. <laughs> and uh, uh, well, that was a wonderful experience as well. Uh, but came back, uh, started from scratch. Um, I felt good about my, my dentistry uh, at the time. I, I've always kept up and worked hard and, and been committed uh, to excellence. And, uh, but uh, I didn't know anything about private practice uh, and I had to learn it all. I, my communication skills weren't good. Uh, you know, I, I remember uh, that the way uh, you got hired, uh, at least in the beginning in my practice, uh, the way you got hired is you came in, you applied for the job. Basically, I said, let me see your hands. I counted the fingers. If there were 10, they were hired. <laughs> I mean, it's, it was all I could do. Uh, well, it was a merry-go-round, coming and going. No one was fulfilled. I was miserable. Uh, insurance was going. I thought you had to be uh, involved in insurance at that point. And, 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 Quite frankly, I was miserable. I mean, you know, sometimes things don't happen until, it, it, you know, it's, it, it all collapses, so to speak, or you get very, very uncomfortable before you actually get off your whatever there and get doing something about it. And that, I hit that fan uh, within a few years. Dentistry was not what I liked. Um, and, uh, you know, then I started to read these books. Sorry about that uh, phone call there. Um, and, and, and I committed to learning uh, a lot about people. My people skills weren't that good. Communication skills weren't that good. Um, and so consequently, I had a lot to learn. And I knew that's where I had to go because I had the dentistry down, but I didn't have the people stuff down. And next thing, I'm, I'm communicating better to patients. I'm certainly uh, understanding people, uh, strangely enough. Uh, uh, you know, we don't get any people courses in any of our education, all the way through K through 12 mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. college or anything. I never had a people course. So it, it, I didn't realize there was so many different people and so many different value systems, so many different approaches and, and, and uh, uh, personalities and whatnot. So. I had to learn the four personality types, and it, it that helped immensely. And it's a lot of that's in the books that I suggested as well. But you know, uh, I committed myself to to long term employees. When I did retire uh, in 2016, my my front desk person had been there um, 
uh, over 20 years, my chair side, 25 years, you know, you, you, you get to the point where you just get better at it. If you really commit yourself to it, it does take a lot of time. Let's, let's, let's face it. It's, uh, uh, it, you talked about your two little kids, um, running two practices and you're doing this and that and the other thing. I mean, <laughs> that's commitment and you're to be committed for it. And I know your podcasts and everything else that you do is going to help a lot of practices and, uh, and that's good to share all that with, with people. And that's kind of what I ended up doing as well, but not everybody has to do that. I mean, you don't have to uh, get crazy with the whole thing, but I do think uh, you, you, you will never have a successful practice without um, uh, determination, endurance, uh, enthusiasm, commitment, all those uh, buzzwords that uh, uh, any successful person uh, would, would say the same thing in whatever it is they're, that they're doing. Um, training the team. I, I know, Dennis, we're not good communicators. We tend to be introverts. And um, we sometimes, I remember one associate, uh, uh, and I helped him, by the way, I had associates over the, over the years towards the end, uh, last 20 years especially, because I was gone so much half the time. Um, and one of the things I never did is have a non-compete clause with an associate. Um, you know, uh, patients aren't stolen. They're lost from a practice. I mean, it, it, so if, if an associate wanted to set up across the street, I was fine with that. Truly, really. Because if a patient left the practice, um, and, and, and they're more comfortable somewhere else, they're going to be better served that way. Uh, or if they left because I had, wasn't caring for them the way I should, or they didn't feel that, or the, you know, the bondings weren't holding and whatnot. So um, you just got to uh, not, not practice from uh, fear of loss, but the, the pie is very big and, and they could set up across the street that it's fine with me. The onus is on me to deliver better care. Um, and, and so when it gets to, I might go into the, some of this uh, on the DSOs, I hear a lot of complaints. Well, it, you know, they're good, bad, what? Uh, well, they are. Um, so if a dentist wants to have their own private practice, they can. Um, the onus is on uh, delivering uh, uh, the highest quality of care, uh, communicating well, having the right team, and, um, uh, you know, just doing all of the above and don't worry about the competition. I never looked at any other dentist as a competition, never, uh, as a colleague. Um, Anyone that came to the area, I would welcome them. I'd go over or invite them over. Um, and, and the same with the DSOs. You, you know, there's going to be good ones. There's going to be bad ones. There's going to, but they're, they just exist. And, and some of them are delivering, uh, I believe, uh, good care, those that grow. And, and, and it's up to the dentist uh, what type of practice, what type of form you want to practice in. Be your own boss. Run your own show. You're going to be spending a lot of hours doing that. Uh, but there's a lot of potential fulfillment in that. It is all what you define as happiness and fulfillment for yourself. Others, like the, you know, the eight to five hours and the management aspects taken care of by others, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot of benefits in that. You can still do high quality dentistry. Um, that's a personal decision. Uh, what you do inside the patient's mouth, really no one really knows about it. I mean, the patient will certainly know about it if it doesn't work or they're uncomfortable, post-operative sensitivity. That's, a, uh, that's an adhesion. We're back to that again. Back on and let you talk about that. Yeah. No matter how good the material is, let's face it, it won't overcome poor technique. And so, uh, uh, but uh, I, I think to worry about DSOs, I know that they've come along. Um, they've been in medicine uh, for a long time. Uh, is a foolish thing to do. Um, they are growing, and, and they're growing, obviously, for good reason. I mean, things don't grow unless there's good reason. I know right now, I latest article, 20% of the profession is, uh, is now practicing in these large uh, dental service organization type environments, or even some of them now, uh, dentists themselves. They call them DDSOs, dentist-owned uh, dental service organizations. And, and uh, so there's a lot of variety out there. And I know they're growing somewhere. I've heard numbers like 10 to 15% per year. And again, you can't grow unless you're 
providing a service to somebody um, there. And but it doesn't have to be that way. If 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 that doesn't work for that, is fine. Don't don't think you have to practice there. Um, I know some dentists coming out of dental school now have got a lot of debt and, and they need a job. Um, I can appreciate that. Um, it, so, uh, but that doesn't mean that's got to be your job for life. Uh, and it may be, it may not be. Uh, but uh, uh, read this book, uh, Simplifying Life, Brett Taylor, or uh, The uh, Successful Happiness by Bill Dickerson, and, and you'll see for yourself that uh, you, you can have whatever it is you want to have. And that was the key, whatever it is that you want to have. So that success, the happiness is going to be unique for each individual. It certainly is. Yes. So you've, just, you've given us so, so much um, uh, wisdom there, Dr. Jackson. So many pearls. I knew you would. You are a well of information. You're an inspiration. I am so excited that you came on the show. I will definitely have you back on. We could do a lecture all about adhesion, if you like. <laughs> I'm, sure, <laughs> I'm sure that listeners would love to hear that as well. You've answered a lot of my questions that I was going to present. Uh, and there again, it's because you're so knowledgeable. Um, now, before we close out, is there anything else that you would like to uh, present to the listeners? Or let me ask you this, what's next for you? What's next for Dr. Jackson? Well, it, it, what's next is basically what I'm doing now. I'd like to do this as long as I can, as long as my wife is healthy and I'm healthy and we're uh, able to, uh, I want to, watch these grandkids grow up and, and go through their school events and uh, uh, be present. And we enjoy that a lot. Um, we enjoy each other a lot. Uh, there's so many years where we, uh, where I was gone, uh, really enjoying that aspect of it. I'll just keep going in, in the free clinic as long as uh, I'm able to do it. Uh, the nice thing about our profession, our profession is so good. <laughs> it really it really offers so much. Um, I, I don't think we, when I was talking about a little while ago about the, uh, you know, always fear of what's next and, and what pressures are on uh, the profession and on individual practices and people feel, turn that around and, 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 and look at the opportunities uh, that, that exist. And, um, because it's amazing. Uh, you can, you can really, uh, we're very, very fortunate. This has been a, uh, this profession has been a, a gift. Uh, it's been a joy. It still is. Um, and, uh, I, as far as what am I going to do next? I, right now it'd be more of the same. Uh, it's, um, just, just, just good. And you had a second question. I can't remember what it was. I, this is what happens. I get rambling. <laughs> it's just because, because you're so knowledgeable. You just have so much experience. And, uh, but that, that was basically it. it. It was what's next. What's next for you. And, and like I said, you're, you're semi-retired, I would say. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It, <laughs> I couldn't go sit on a rock and, and uh, no, that, that wouldn't work for me. Uh, it's, uh, it's just too much fun. Um, and, uh, and it's fulfilling. Uh, let's face it. This is uh, happiness has a lot to do with fulfillment. Uh, how do you feel about your life and what you're doing? And, 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 there are, that's not to say we don't run into issues. <laughs> you know, um, we, we obviously do. I mean, it's not all a bed of roses. It doesn't have to be a bed of roses. In fact, uh, uh, this is what the definition of experience is. is uh, uh, it, it, that's what mistakes are. They're, they're, they're an experience, and you learn from them. And, uh, you know, make it a lifelong learning experience. There's always something interesting going on. Um, so that's 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 my outlook uh and what i uh would say how i see it it may or may not be right for everybody and, and but it certainly has has worked uh very well for me and i'm very grateful great great and how would uh listeners 
uh, get in touch with you. I know that you give advice. You help uh, dentists who have questions on adhesion and cosmetics. I know that you've made yourself readily available. We've known each other for years, but you also, you know, volunteered to help me with any uh, cases or anything of that sort. So if people are listening, they know you're this expert and guru and adhesion and, and materials and just aesthetic dentistry alike. How would someone get in touch with you? Well, uh, uh, my email address um, is ron at ronjacksondds.com. And as long as uh, you don't email me when the patient's in the chair, um, it's a little too late then. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the other issue is uh, I also want to say, uh, yes, I still get a lot of emails. I don't always answer them right away because I've got life going on uh, and I'm not around all the time. But nevertheless, uh, so that's why, uh, you know, don't expect an immediate answer. You may get one, you may not. But um, And I also want to say, too, that it's not a substitute for going to a CE lecture mm -hmm. course. Uh, I, I sometimes get an email, uh, teach me everything you know about adhesion. Well, you can't do that in an email. <laughs> it just uh, doesn't work um, there. And uh, Or I had post-operative sensitivity on a molar yesterday. What did I do wrong? Um, that's, that's also not possible to answer a question like that. Uh, but yes, uh, certainly um, many questions um, uh, are appropriate for an email sort of thing, but uh, not a substitute for a, a formal CE course. <laughs> That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So um, thank you so much, Dr. Jackson, for, for once again for coming on the show. Like I said, super excited. So glad you were here. Uh, we thank you for all of your contributions to, to dentistry uh, and just your world of knowledge. So thank you so much for being on the show. Well, thank you, Evelyn, and I hope I've said something that'll be of use to some of the listeners. You absolutely have. So, this concludes another episode of the Efficient Practice Podcast. Uh, if you have not, please subscribe to the show, rate, and review it. We're now available on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, and many of the other podcast mediums. And also, if you have not joined, please join our free Facebook group. It's called the Efficiency Now Network. There are business owners, dentists, auxiliary, who are all on there and we're all using efficient practices to run our businesses better or we're developing efficient practices like dental practices and medical practices. And we're all helping each other to increase our productivity, our profit profitability, and just have a better quality of life. So until next time, this is Dr. Evelyn signing off. We will see you then. Take care and be well. Bye-bye.